this is the fourth, fifth. Fifth with me. Fifth year of doing it with Mr. Woods. The sixth year of presenting it, no, seventh year of presenting it in the library. And how it all happened is a previous incarnation of a speech team leader, supervisor, ex coach. coach extraordinaire, um, came to me one day and we dis I said, I'd never seen a speech team perform. And what do they do? So he said, well, um, they do speeches. So I said, that's not very illuminating or elucidating. So would you please maybe have a performance here in the library? So mummies and daddies can come and brothers and sisters and fellow students who need extra credit. So here we all are. And so welcome to the seventh annual night before Nats and I introduce you to Coach Extraordinaire. Thank you. <laughs> um, feel free to start every class that way, by the way. Just keep that in mind for free. I'm, I'm not going to stop you if you want to start doing that. Uh, everybody, thank you for coming. I know the majority of you are my students. Uh, I know this is for extra credit, which apparently you need. I apologize for that, I guess. Uh, but thank you for coming. Your, your presence here is, is crucial to us because in about a week and a half, we go to Denver, Colorado, where our students will compete against some of the best community colleges in the country, uh, crafting the best speeches they can, and you're our last final audience before we go to do the big show. And so your presence uh, and your role is vital in them really crafting the best speeches possible uh, to give to you. And so tonight, hopefully we'll entertain you. We'll kind of show you some advanced versions of what you've done in the classroom. styles of performance, uh, one of which may include me uh, giving some kind of speech. We'll see how much time we have. Uh, but the first presentation we're going to see is the more traditional kind of presentation. Now we've kind of put the most complex, heaviest one first since you're fresh and ready to go. You've just, you've just now sat down and you're, you feel refreshed. So the first speech you're going to see is called communication analysis. It's a communication analysis. This student's goal is to analyze some kind of communication event, whether it's a campaign, a billboard, a television show, a website, to try and figure out what is unique about it, why does it work, why does it not work, and draw some implications for what this kind of communication could mean for us on a societal level, on a big level. Now, as you'll see, the student is completely memorized. Uh, the student revised the entire speech a week and a half ago. So imagine if you were to give your speech word for word from your outline uh, and had to give it in six days, right? memorizing word for word. That's what we have to do to be competitive on the national level. So you'll see Anna Gay, who will be coming up here in a second. Uh, she is a, not only a regional and state champion, last year she was also a national champion for Central Texas College uh, at last year's national tournament. And so again, she'll hopefully, hopefully do it a, a repeat uh, of last year. But if not, uh, you'll, you'll be nothing but impressed, I promise you, by the next communication analysis you're going to see, Anna Gay. On July 12, 2013, Malala Yousafzai, a 16-year-old activist and Nobel Peace Prize nominee, was gunned down by the Taliban for promoting education for women. The Pakistani Taliban who shot Malala have also bombed over 800 schools throughout Pakistan to prevent women from receiving an education. The Express Tribune notes on March 10, 2014, that Pakistan is ranked second lowest among 136 countries in gender equality, as women in various Islamic nations are now seeking many of the liberties American women sought in the early 20th century. Now, they have a new ally, the Burqa Avenger. According to the New York Daily News on August 6, 2013, the Burqa Avenger is Pakistan's first animated children's show and is set to go global in 60 countries and 18 languages. It stars Gia, a school teacher by day, but by night, she dons a traditional Muslim burqa to fight corrupt villains trying to shut down her school, armed with only books and pins. Along with Katniss Everdeen and Tony Stark, December, Time Magazine on December 9th, 2013, named the Burqa Avenger one of the most influential fictional characters of 2013. The show's creator, Aaron Harun Rashid, told the Washington Post on August 1st, 2013, that the show is intended to educate and inspire children 
in one of the most illiterate nations on earth. The Barca Avenger employs messages of women's empowerment while still preserving an Islamic identity, begging the question, how can children's entertainment be used to unify feminist ideologies and Islamic culture to elicit social equality for women? To answer this question, we will look to Sahar Kamis's article, Islamic Feminism in New Arab Media, from the Journal of Arab and Muslim Media Research, December 2010. Because this model evaluates how Islamic feminism has gained acceptance in nations where Islam is used as a justification for women's subjugation, it is perfect for analysis. So first, we will define the model. Next, apply the model to the Burqa Avenger. And finally, it's draw out some implications of what take part on July 28, 2013 calls Pakistan's ass-kicking superhero. Kamis explains that due to the high illiteracy rate, authoritarian Islamic governments have exercised tight control over broadcast media, making television the most influential medium in the Arab world. While openly feminist arguments would receive backlash from such governments, Islamic feminism <laughs> which portrays Islam as a way of life open equally to men and women, has gained acceptance by employing three tenets. Operating within an Islamic framework, the personal interpretation of religion, and the manifestation of resistances. First, the media must operate within an Islamic framework. Kamis asserts that Islamic feminism attempts to counter top-down secular feminism by promoting messages of equality that operate within rather than without an Islamic context and frame of reference in demonstrating that Muslim women may retain their religious beliefs <coughs> rather than adopt the ideologies of Western feminists, a more culturally relevant form of feminism emerges that promotes equality without sacrificing faith. Second, the media should allow for the personal interpretation of religion. Kamis explains that media such as the internet and satellite television has signaled a shift from the traditional authority of Islamic scholars who were solely responsible for interpreting religion to that of the people themselves, now free from the static dogma. Thus, they are empowered to resist state-promoted inequity by seeing themselves as spiritual equals of men. Third, empowering the manifestation of resistances. Islamic feminists situate themselves transnationally as strong women and righteous Muslims committed to social justice. By advocating goals grounded in their religion, these women become spiritual warriors, creating a united ideological movement that didn't previously exist, giving them the courage to speak out against oppression. This allows the whole society to move progressively towards a better future. Now that we have defined the model, next we will apply it to the Burqa Avenger. First, the media must operate within the context of Islam. Harun, the show's creator, explained to CNN on August 5th, 2013, that by wearing the Burqa, Jia is obviously both a Muslim woman and a superhero. Children's programming in the Arab world is almost entirely imported from the West. While Jia is a local role model that shares her audience's cultural identity, Jia employs the burqa, which many Western and liberal Pakistani feminists see as a patriarchal symbol of oppression, and she turns it against her oppressors as a tool to defeat them, gaining strength from her religious beliefs. The burqa avenger provides its audience with a superhero that reflects their values by combining female equality with faith thereby fulfilling our first tenet. Second, the media must allow for beliefs to be interpreted on a personal level. The main villains of the show, an evil magician and corrupt mayor, emulate real Taliban clerics and politicians in Pakistan as they try to shut down the school to keep Jia students uneducated. However, the Burqa Avenger fights back against their dominant dogma, rhetorically and literally, by advocating her own progressive interpretation of Islam, which champions education for women. The Burqa Avenger shows its audience that they can fight back against this hegemonic interpretation of Islam to create their own meaning. 
thereby fulfilling our second tenet. Third, the media should allow for resistances. After the girls' school is closed, Ashu, a schoolgirl inspired by her teacher and the Burka Avenger, resists the closure declaring, how can you shut down the school? We need education. It is our right. And a female television reporter criticizes the corrupt city officials, calling them evil tyrants, asking, will they stop the girls from eating and breathing too? These declarations demonstrate solidarity of opinion, showing those that sympathize with the Burka Avengers cause that they are not alone. Because the Burka Avenger will not only be shown in Pakistan, but throughout the world, it is a transnational voice of resistance against women's oppression, thereby fulfilling our third tenet. Now that we have applied the Burka Avenger, applied the model to the Burka Avenger, we can return to our research question. How can children's entertainment be used to reconcile feminist ideology and Islamic culture to elicit social equality for women? The Burqa Avenger isn't just promoting equality amongst Muslims. They are showing the world a form of feminism that departs in many ways from that of Western feminism. This show adds to the credibility of and importance of Islamic feminism as it works within the framework of religion to promote social change. This yields two implications. To begin, Laura Ferraccioli explained in the 2013 Journal of Intercultural Studies that many feminists see the burqa as a patriarchal symbol of oppression that should be cast off. However, the Journal of Ethnic and Racial Studies on March 6, 2014 notes, notes that the province of Quebec considered a public veil ban and their feminist groups were divided on the subject. Those opposing the ban explained that they supported bodily and personal autonomy for all women, as well as all women's capacity to understand and articulate their experiences of oppression on their own terms. An idea well suited to the indigenous form of feminism that the show promotes. The Burqa Avenger explicitly shows Muslim women and girls that they have the right to choose on their own whether or not they wear traditional Muslim coverings, and that choosing one way or another does not make one a better or worse Muslim. Reminding Islamic, as well as Western feminists, that the goal of feminism is to empower choice, not to deny it. Finally, while working within accepted cultural and religious <coughs> norms lends Islamic feminism its strength and makes it more palatable to those in power, it may also fail to impact male audiences as profoundly as female ones. <laughs> By excluding men from women's rights discussion, we lose the ability to provide a positive male feminist role model for young boys. <laughs> as well as to include the voices which are sadly the most valued in the regions where the Burqa Avenger is needed the most. Because these societies are male-dominated, any discourse in which men support liberating women from their societal constraints could help in gaining ground by increasing the visibility of the message everyone is equal for both girls and boys. Consequently, future research should explore the rhetorical presence and power of men and children in the fight for the rights of Muslim women. So today we shed light on the Burqa Avenger using Sahar Kamisa's article, which illuminated the power of using children's entertainment to interweave feminist ideals into the Islamic culture. Al Jazeera America on October 14, 2013 states that the victories of Muslim women lie not in the abdication, but in the resistance and reclamation of their faith and culture to empower themselves. Fortunately, we have the Burqa Avenger, who is doing just that. The next presentation you're gonna see is from the category called Limited Preparation. Uh, the student, Brandy Alexander, who's about to speak, uh, is uh, Highly decorated um, uh, student, won uh, several uh, major rankings both on the state and regional level. She's also a member of the All-State team. Uh, amongst all universities and colleges, she was selected amongst one of the most competitive and academically superior students in the state. Uh, she's doing a speech 
where she's been given 30 minutes to answer a question about international politics using only the research at her disposal that she brought on her laptop. So imagine if you were to do your speech in class using eight to 10 sources and only prepare in 10 minutes to give that speech. That's what Brandy's about to do. Literally 45 minutes ago, she was handed a question, had to research, prepare, and come up and answer and deliver that speech to you. Both the preparation and the practice falls inside of that. So as you'll see, she'll, there'll be a lot of uh, citations of sources and arguing amongst that an extemporaneous style of speaking. So with no further ado, Brandy Alexander with Extemporaneous Speaking. In 2008, the tragedy of the breakup between Justin Timberlake and Britney Spears shocked pop media culture and everyone else in the international community, wondering whether if we will ever recover from this huge national tragedy. <laughs> However, there's been a new tragedy that has happened that is similar to the relationship between Justin and Britney. Russia and the United States are now fighting over the huge breakup of Crimea, sparking international attention with the media on whether or not we should do it. This is furthermore explained among The Economist of March 29th, 2014, that earlier this month, Russia had annexed Crimea. And, and while many Kremlin and pro moscow Ukrainians have rejoiced in the fact that Crimea may potentially be part of Russia, it has also boosted Putin's approval rate from 65% to 80%. However, despite the fact that Russians and pro moscans and Ukrainians are rejoicing, it has caused a lot of controversy on whether or not this is economically feasible, whether or not this is controversial, and whether this is even legal to do. Furthermore, the BBC News of March 11, 2014 reports that since the referendum has happened, it has sparked old Cold War tensions between the United States and Russia because of the annexation of Crimea, furthering on to leading a new potential war between the United States Russia, and the international community. Thus, this brings us to today's question. Is Russia likely to back out of its plan to annex Ukraine's Crimea region, or are they there to stay? And I believe that despite what Putin thinks, being strong and mighty and shirtless on a horse, <laughs> Russia needs to back out of Crimea for two reasons. First, because staying in Crimea is economically unfeasible. And secondly, because it will ruin any Russian diplomacy. But first, we have to explain how staying in Crimea is economically unfeasible and will crumble their economy if they stay in Crimea. We can see this. First, that Russia will lose any oil and natural gas resources. And second, that the sanctions placed upon Russia will cripple their economy. First, we have to explain how, there needs to be, how there's going to be a loss of oil for Russia to sell. According to the National Public Radio of March 16, 2014, over 70% of Russian exports are surprisingly not manufacturing, but energy. <laughs> Since they've gone, exported energy, Russia's per capita income has risen from 1,700 to over $10,000 per year, meaning they are getting huge foothold from this energy resource. However, the Christian Science Monitor of March 21st, 2014 reports that major Russian ex imports from the oil come from Ukraine, which has geographical footholding to four to 13 trillion cubic meters of natural gas and oil. Russia has to get this oil from Ukraine. And since Ukraine is now fighting against Russia, Ukraine will not give Russia these oil and natural gases it needs to keep its economy alive. The fact that Russia needs to realize they need a back out of Crimea in order for Russia to stay an economic stable powerhouse and giving energy and for its ec economy in the long run. The loss in oil and natural resources make it economically unfeasible for Russia to stay in Crimea and that it needs to back out. Secondly though, we can look towards how Russian sanctions will cripple their own economy. Bloomberg of March 24th, 2014 reported that Sanctions, which are pretty much laws against going for a country, has been placed by the G8 and United Nations. Most of, these, most of these sanctions have been from freezing of assets from key people who hold a lot of money in Russia. But additionally, since these sanctions have occurred because Russia has taken over Crimea, their stocks have has declined by 13%. Their investors have taken out $6.1 billion dollars and ultimately, the ruble, which is Russia's currency, has declined 7.3% in its footholding. The fact that there is proof that Russia's economy is falling because of the current sanctions right now, Russia cannot hold on to Crimea because it will further detriment itself as an economy. From the fact that these sanctions are crippling their economy, it is economically unfeasible. And there we should see that Russia needs to back out of Crimea from the fact that they are losing oil and natural resources and that their economy is crumbling from these sanctions, 
it is economically unfeasible for Russia to stay in Crimea and that they need to back out. But now that we understand how it's economic un economically unfeasible, we have to understand how them staying in Crimea will ruin any diplomacy. Through the fact that the Crimean annexation is not internationally recognized, and also that there's Russian suspension among the G8 party. First though, the fact that Crimea is annexation is not recognized by the international community is a huge blow to Russia. Reuters on March 27, 2014 reported that the European Union has condemned these acts of Russia, calling them acts of aggression towards the international community. Furthermore, Al Jazeera of March 7, 2014 reported that the United Nations General Meeting produced a general consensus with over half of them agreeing that this annexation of Crimea is illegal. Because there are such huge politically powerful nations that are against what Russia is doing and will not recognize that Crimea is officially annexed, Russia has no footholding and it will ruin any diplomacy that they have if they stay in Crimea, proving Russia needs to back out. Secondly, we can look towards how there is Russian suspension from this G8 party, with the G8 party being the eight most international, political, powerful parties that pretty much have a general consensus of what they should do in the world. The Washington Post on March 24, 2014, reported that the G8 party, seven of them against one, had suspended Russia indefinitely, with President Vladimir Putin of Russia, being ironically the leader, now suspended. Because the G8 party has had such against Russia, they have also imposed stronger sanctions, as cited earlier, will cripple their economy. Because Russia <coughs> is against seven from one, it will ruin any diplomacy that they have, proving that Russia needs to back out. From the fact that nobody in the international community recognizes the annexation of Crimea, and that there is Russian suspension from the G8 party, they will ruin any Russian diplomacy if they do not back out of Crimea. But now we can return to today's question. Is Russia likely to back out of its plan to annex Ukraine's Crimea region? Or are they there to stay? And I believe Russia is going to back out for two reasons. First, it's economically unfeasible for Russia to stay in Crimea. And secondly, because it will ruin any Russian diplomacy if they continue on and hold on to Crimea. But as we see, as the United States had the major troubling times of Justin and Brittany breaking up, today in 2014, we have a new prompt, we have a new type of problem, where we might have international war, and the one thing that will come out of it is Crimea River. <laughs> it's actually called the interpretation of literature. It's very different than what you would see kind of in a speech class. Uh, the next performer will be taking, uh, has taken a short story, and basically her job is to narrate that story and basically competitively perform as that narrator, creating a realistic voice, telling what seems to be a real story. Now, because this, this does come from literature, there may be some adult themes that may be uh, involve some language. I would give it about a PG-13-ish kind of rating, uh, just a little FYI. Uh, coming at you, uh, and the goal of this po of this poem is to ring true to the audience, right? For the for the audience to feel the emotions and experience what the narrator has gone through. Uh, Catherine Lovatu who coming up next is a regional champion, uh, as well as second place in the country last year in her respective events, and will be coming up again for a prose interpretation. Her last name is Lavati. It's spelled real weird. H L A V A T Y, uh, not Lavati. Uh, so, with no further ado, Catherine. I was on my second bag of Doritos and my lips were stained emergency orange when my best friend Philip said that he knew a bar in Hallyu Junction that didn't card, so maybe we should go. We had been sitting in my living room for 18 or 19 hours watching Robert Redford movies. The coroner had wheeled my mother out all those hours ago, but my mother was no longer my mother. She'd become Anna Schroeder, the deceased. And my grandma Hannah had been on the phone trying to track down my dad. Sigmund Freud analyzed the process of mourning and loss finding that individuals, when faced with death, will be forced to use all of their emotional energy testing the reality they live in. This reality testing time is marked by disinterest, dejection, and inability to love. Freud further explains that this reality testing time is crucial because it allows a person to be freed from the lost object. However, sometimes 
Our desire to hold on to or forget those we have lost becomes an all-consuming need. In the following short story, a young girl rejects the reality of her mother's death in order to cope with her loss. A Good Deuce by Jody Angel. It was Christy who had found her and I wish it had been me. You know, not because I wanted to spare Christy the sight of what she'd seen, but because for the rest of her life, Christy could, could fuck up or give up or not show up and nobody would care because, you know, Jesus Christ, her mother died and she was the one who found the body. Christy had a free ticket to the minimum. And I had this little orange bottle shoved deep in the front pocket of my jeans. An amber cylinder with a name on it that was my mother, half full of little blue ovals the size of Tic Tacs. When Christy and I had rolled my mother over, not for the first time, she'd had the bottle clutched in her hand and I had to pry it loose because I didn't want her to be seen like that. People are too quick to judge because it's easier than to understand. We walked across a short parking lot and up to the building. The bar was, was small and full, maybe 15 people along the bar, and I was immediately disappointed. There was no band, and, and the men at the bar were old and thick and slow, and what women we saw didn't look like they needed their honor protected. <laughs> Philip was just as disappointed as I was, but he got over it quicker. He went to rake in the bar stools, put down money, and two Budweiser's were uncapped and set in front of him. And that was it. There was, there was no emergency, no joke, no, hey, get the fuck out of here. No bouncers grabbing us by our collars and throwing us to the gravel outside. Philip brought me a bottle and I swallowed as much as my mouth could hold. And that was that. I'd had my first drink in a bar. We found a table in the corner near the jukebox and we both slid in. And Philip raised his bottle in the gesture of a toast, and, and for a second I was afraid he was going to do it, to drink to my mother or say her name or tell me how sorry he was about what happened, and I hated him a little bit for doing it now, here like this, but instead, so do you mind if we sit with you? I looked up, and there were two women standing in front of our table, both with a beer in each hand. Philip raised his eyebrows in a silent gesture of, sure, why the hell not? So they leaned over and told us their names, and we went around the table. Philip, Veronica, Candy, and me. Candy and Veronica liked to drink and weren't tight with their money, so the drinking led to talking. Hey, you know what? Her grandparents are Nazis. I'm not kidding! Tell them! Tell them about that time you had to help. You found all of that swastika armband and shit in your grandpa's closet. And it was something that I had seen once, and maybe I had, maybe I hadn't. And I tried to remember, and, and I put myself back in that room with my grandma facing the window, tears streaming down her face, because I had said it, I had said the things, I had called her names. I had told her how every time my mom got off the phone with her, she would disappear. And you know what? Not once in 17 years do I ever remember any of them asking me how I felt. Not once, how do you feel? Because feelings are lies. The only truth is what you can see. So did they kill people? <laughs> kill people? Probably. Hey, you know what? You should tell them about that time you had to help your grandma drown all those kittens. Oh my god. Okay, so like grandma put them in the sack and they had to throw them in the pond on their farm. And Candy had closed her mouth and she wouldn't look at me. She was staring at Philip and Philip was smiling and taking his time getting to the punchline. Problem is though, grandma didn't weigh the bag down, like put like rocks in it or anything. So this bag just floats on the water and they have to listen to all of these kittens screaming until they dry. Screaming, fucking screaming, like hearing babies cry. She turned towards the table, and she looked at me. You swam out to get them, right? There was nothing I could do. Grandma wouldn't let me. And, um, and so, so her grandma just, just stands there and watches the kittens drown. 
Fucking Nazis, man. <laughs> oh my god. Candy said, and, and there was something in her face that made me want to put my hand over hers and let her know that I was just as sorry as she was. <gasps> How long did it take? Twenty minutes. No one said anything, and and I could remember watching that brown sack take on water, and the way the pond smelled with all of its mud and fish and seagrass. And and I had taken off my shoes to go out and get them, but Grandma Hannah had put her hand on my arm. She didn't say no or, or stop. She just kept her hand there, and so. We stood there and we watched the sack together and listened to the kittens crying on and on until one by one they finally drowned. And then the last kitten finally gave up and went down with the weight. <coughs> I took a swallow of my beer and, and it was warm and hard to get down and it eventually got the best of me so I had to go find a bathroom. When I got back there were two more beers in front of Candy and Philip and Veronica were kissing. Philip told me, Candy said, and for a second I was confused. And I was back in my living room and in the corner by the front door were the two garbage bags that we had to use to soak up what had come out of my mom. And I had to run, I had to hide, I had to get rid of it. <sighs> Everything except for that little orange bottle in my front pocket. So, I dug it out, and I gave it to Candy. She took it from me and she read the label. Oxycontin. Who's Sharon O'Donnell? Um, some, sometimes my mother. Oh, well, had she been sick? And I remembered the nights of hearing crying in the bedroom, the sound, muffled sound of the pillows taking the brunt of her sobs while Christy and I sat on the couch inches apart and the only thing we moved was our eyes. Yeah, um, she's been dead for 26 hours. She didn't say anything and Candy took the bottle from me and I let her, and she put her hand over mine, and I let her, and I could feel that her palm was soft and cool and so much different than the hot thigh pressed against me, and I wanted to cry to apologize to say something, but... I know I'm going to have to come back up to the surface soon. I just... I just don't know how long I can stay. presentation we have is more of a traditional one. Many of you have done this uh, out there in the audience. Next is an informative speech presentation. The goal is to basically be an educator and to teach about something. Uh, competitively, uh, to do well, you have to pick something that is really cutting edge, that is changing uh, pretty frequently or is brand new. Unfortunately, as Brandy found out, uh, some of you will, will hear her topic. Her topic has significantly changed even in the past few days. So it's made the revision process pretty dramatic, very difficult for her. Uh, I think just three days ago, did a major, major revision to some components of her speech. But because she is awesome and a champ, she's about to give her informative presentation to us today to hopefully educate you and teach you about something that's pretty rad. So Brandy Alexander with informative speaking. In a cozy San Francisco public library, a loud crash occurred in the science fiction section where two men tackle a pale man jean to the ground, shouting, where the FBI, as they arrested 29-year-old Ross Ulbricht, the creator of the online global black market, The Silk Road, that had dealt in narcotic trafficking, money laundering, and soliciting murder for hire, as reported by The Guardian of November 10, 2013. Amazingly, Ulbricht was able to build a criminal empire valued at over $34.5 million, but unlike other criminal organizations, did not use the dollar, euro, yen, or any other country's currency for that matter. Instead, Silk Road operated completely on the digital currency known as Bitcoin, 
a virtual cryptocurrency, or an online currency that is not backed by any financial institution or government and has been gaining popularity since 2008. Beyond the noise, Bitcoin has sparked media attention with stories of Bitcoin millionaires and the hunt for the anonymous creator of this currency as reported by the Times of India of March 10, 2014. Bitcoin has gained a major footholding in currency due to the fact they're worth quite a bit. Today, according to the Wolfram Alpha page, it is reported that one Bitcoin is worth over $600 and because Bitcoins can be used to anonymously transfer funds, it has become quite attractive to black marketeers like Silk Road and NSA wear Americans <coughs> wary alike. Even fe formal Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke, who wrote that Bitcoin and other virtual currencies may hold long-term promise, particularly if the innovations promote a faster, more secure, and more efficient payment system. So, to see, understand why an invisible currency backed by nothing has government up in arms and investors scrambling to collect it, we must first look at how Bitcoin works. Second, the uses for it. And last, the implications for which the Los Angeles Times of March 6, 2014 calls a multi-billion dollar global phenomenon. Now, there are other investors less <coughs> confident in Bitcoin's realness. The Bloomberg Business Week of January 9, 2014 <coughs> called the currency a beautiful unicorn. <laughs> However, there are other investors and prospectors who are willing to back up Bitcoin. To understand why, we have to look at how Bitcoin works. In order to get a, you can gain Bitcoins through two ways. You can either mine them or buy them. Buying them is simple enough. With websites such as Coinbase.com and Clickycoin, make the purchase as like any other online purchase. Mining them, however, is a bit more difficult. According to Bit. Bitcoin.org, last accessed on March 12, 2014, users can de must dedicate a device that has internet access, just any phone or PC will do. Download the official mining software from the website, and then wait for the software to send out a complex mathematical algorithm. Every device that is connected receives the same algorithm, and then it calculates billions of possible equations to solve it. Like any good math student, the device solves the equation by guessing. It gives a random answer, checks to see if it's right, and if it's wrong, it tries again. If your device gets it first, you win 25 Bitcoin, but don't get too excited yet. With every, all, as the more connected devices there are, the harder the equation becomes to solve. Once a Bitcoin is released, it is published on a public ledger called the blockchain, which is basically a posting for Bitcoin miners. And since anyone can verify when a Bitcoin is released and where to, it makes counterfeit near impossible. The Telegraph of January 15th, 2014, explains that Bitcoins can be stored on a user's own device, such as a phone or a thumb drive, or on an online cloud storage with a software known as a wallet. Each wallet has a public and a private key. When a transaction is initiated, the public key, which works like a bank's account number, is released. And for the transaction to be verified, it is given to the public number. But the private key, which works like the bank's PIN, ensures that only the person who owns the account is able to manage the money. Through the Bitcoin, through the Bitcoin private and public <coughs> account, it ensures that it is a verifiable and secure method of payment. But understanding how Bitcoin comes into circulation is just the beginning of its buying power. We have to look at the potential for it. First, Bitcoin is accepted by various organizations and retailers. MIT Technology Review of November 19, 2014 acknowledges Bitcoin advancing status as a monetary system that can continue to grow. Today, Bitcoin, organization, Bitcoin retailers are growing with small businesses such as an Arizona lawyer and a lemonade stand run by two little girls in San Francisco to big organizations such as Overstock.com and the online gaming company Zynga. Also, there are websites that will exchange Bitcoin, to, such as Gift, that will, give it, give, give, that will have gift card retailers to big organizations such as Amazon, Victoria's Secret, and CVS.
Also, businesses love Bitcoin because unlike credit card companies, which charge about 3% per transaction, Bitcoin does not have any transactions fees, incentivizing its adoption. Second, since Bitcoin transactions are quick, reliable, and anonymous, it makes it perfect for giving to charities and projects. Overseas, Bitcoins are being donated to the humanitarian aid in the Ukrainian crisis. <coughs> Volunteers have set up Bitcoin wallets, holding up signs with the QR code linking to their Bitcoin wallet. Coindesk of February 27, 2014, explains that these Bitcoin donations <coughs> go towards food and blankets for protesters and for medical treatment for the wounded. While Russia has banned Bitcoin and the embattled Ukraine Ukrainian leadership has declared any warning against a currency that is not backed by a financial institution. This is, does not deter donors from giving generously to controversial causes because Bitcoin gives a secure and anonymous way to give these funds. <coughs> now understanding its buying potential leads us to understand how we can draw the implications for Bitcoin. First, Bitcoin combines the value of cash and encryption, which can imply new taxation laws. There are tax attorneys, such as Lee Shepard, who told to CNN Money on the March 11, 2014, that Bitcoin should follow the 1970 U.S. tax code called the barter system, which has customers trade in their hard assets for trade units. According to the court decision, the barter system requires that users report their transactions and to be tax on the fair market value of the property received in exchange. Ultimately though, it is the Internal Revenue Service who will determine whether Bitcoins can or should be taxed. The, Wa the Wall Street Journal of December 20, 2013 reports that the IRS has yet to make a definitive ruling on the issue. Virtual currencies are continuing to be studied, including its consequences, and it will continue to go, and it will continue to explain whether or not it should be used and how we will continue to tax it. Second, <coughs> Bitcoin questions the legal status of this already established currency. The Washington Post of March 8, 2014, reported that Mt. Gox, the largest Bitcoin exchange, had filed for bankruptcy on February 28, 2014. The problem and, and has had huge fines of over $75 million. The problem arose when once news of the fine broke out, users began, began withdrawing all their money, leaving no money for Mt. Gox to hold the withdrawals. If this happened at a United States bank, the Federal Reserve would step in with the emergency cash in order to cover and keep the bank's solvency. But being backed by nothing, Bitcoin lacks any legal status. The New York Times of March 6, 2014 argues that there's been huge money fraud throughout the years, from Bernie Madoff to the target hacking, yet citizens do not abandon the dollar as a means of currency. Unlike other currencies, Bitcoin may force a new type of Darwinian race because of the public ledger that promotes transparency that other countries and <coughs> other countries' currencies may eventually have to follow suit. So today, we've delved into the new emerging cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. We first looked at how it works. Second, the uses for it. And last, we examined both sides of the coin to draw some implication. Satoshi Nakamoto, the pseudonym for the person or persons who created Bitcoin, 
never would have imagined his, her, or their abstract money concept to be part of a controversial issue, but did believe in the idea of a revolutionary currency. Bitcoin promises a new type of banking, one where the people, not the government, control currency. To go. Uh, well, we're turning back to the oral interpretation component. Uh, the next one again is from Catherine uh, Lavati. Uh, the next one is a little bit more confusing than a prose. It's not a traditional story that you would have. Instead of this next event, Catherine actually found different pieces of literature from different kinds of literary genres. So from poetry, drama, and prose. And she kind of put them into a schizophrenic collage about something. And so the goal is to create kind of an argument using literature. Uh, this next one kind of involves and makes commentary on issues of race, of socioeconomic status, of interpersonal relationships, all by discussing a central theme and idea. So the job is to provide a critical eye on certain elements that exist around us using literature. So with no further ado, Catherine Lavati with Programmed Oral Interpretation. Now, as you may have heard, I got fired from my job at the Food Network for saying a whole buttload of racist things. But now I'm getting my start here on the internet, and I'm gonna make you Paula Dean's apology cake, or I show you just how sorry I am. Mm -hmm. Chocolate as dark as Africa. Feminism is most visible in legislation and large-scale protests. But it begins when you stop apologizing for yourself. When you stop making excuses for the names that other people have hung around your neck. Being cast out is a fear that we have all had for as long as time has run ahead of us. In the basement, my littlest sister first said the phrase that would plague the rest of my childhood. Sorry doesn't cut it. Sorry doesn't cut it. The phrase appeared again and again and was an enraging reminder that each action is essentially irrevocable. If I couldn't use words to erase a blow, what other choice did I have? So I threw another punch. During his two decades worth of research at the Berkeley Center for Forgiveness, Dr. Everett Worthington discovered that despite the positive physical and social implications of accepting an apology, America has developed a dark side. He argues that apologies have become addictive because they allow us to feel superior, creating a kind of social high. So as a culture, we make apologies, both public and private, to escape the pressure of a situation, knowing that it makes both parties feel positively about themselves even though we run the risk of public humiliation. Using the poetry for those girls by Anna Volkovich, Apology by Shane Coisen, Mom's Apology by Cheryl Ball, The Prose, All Apologies by Eula Bliss, The Drama, A South Park Episode, Coon Chu Hindsight by Trey Park and Matt Stone, and the YouTube video, College Humor, Paula Dean Apology Cake. Does the intent of the apology, no matter how selfish, make it any less valuable? Forgive me, I'm not sorry. A program. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I keep saying I'm sorry. And I apologize for, for stupid shit and trivial things. But she sings a song of sweet logic and tells me that apology should grow like trees, only able to bear fruit if its roots are planted in the soil of genuine sincerity. But I am not sorry that I completely dig you. <coughs> this cake is based on an old Dean family recipe that I found when I was cleaning out my great-grandpappy's attic. So now as you can see on this piece of parchment that <laughs> cheddar sticks, this is a deed of ownership for another human being. It was a simpler time. Some might say a better time, but... Oh, well, would you look here? I'm gonna need some nutmeg for a serious offense 
right psychiatrist Anne Lazier, such as a betrayal of trust or public humiliation, an immediate apology misses the mark. For offenses whose impact has been calamitous to individuals, nations, or groups, the apology can be delayed by decades and offered by another generation. For example, Reagan signed legislation in 1988 officially apologizing for the internment of Japanese Americans in World War II. You see, now he had originally threatened to veto the measure, but later claimed that he was only opposed to the cost of the bill and not the concept. Hello. My name is Tony Hayward, President and CEO of BP. Our accidental drilling spell in the Gulf was a tragedy that should have never happened. So to all those affected, we would like to say, we are deeply sorry. <coughs> we are sorry. We're sorry. We're sorry. Sorry. BP has taken full responsibility for cleaning up the oil in the Gulf. And in doing so, we have changed our name from beyond petroleum to dependable petroleum, DP. <laughs> so we no longer screw the earth, now we DP it. My little sister stood in the doorway with her arms outstretched to grip the door jam. She had this little ladybug t-shirt that didn't quite cover her round tummy. <clears throat> so that's where I punched her. There wasn't a moment of doubt. She was standing there with her arms out, so I punched her in the stomach as hard as I could. It, it was an experiment, and I was sorry the instant I hit her. I had knocked the wind out of a toddler. I'm sorry. But really, I had already begun to feel something else. Please just, please just don't tell Mom. I am your mother. And what I am going to tell you is not easy. I am so sorry your father had to die this way. I regret having to call you here to see him and not hear my baby. I apologize that I am making you stay here like an anchorless boat holds the weight in the roughest of waters. I'm sorry that I'm holding your heart here and that old city, ugly city is one that you can never go back to. I'm sorry that I'm the only one you will ever trust again. But this burden is so heavy for me. But I'm sorry, but I apologize. But I am most sorry because I can't do this. At all. But you can. Your strength is not yet fatigued by the efforts of loving unapologetically, and I mustn't let you know that you can be strong. Or it all dies. You, him, our family. He told me so, and I'm sorry that you can't hear him when he speaks to me, and I am so sorry you feel I have to be sorry. Don't worry. I will always apologize as long as you stay to hear it. I promise. And I'm sorry, but I want to kiss you every time you have something beautiful to say, and you are so beautiful, beautiful in a you kind of way. And I want the sky to fracture under the impossible weight of an apology because I am so sorry. I am sorry that I want so much. And I'm sorry that I've been using I'm sorry as a crutch to lean on for so long. But if you sing me that song of sweet logic again, I promise to make an effort to stand on my own. So, girl, don't expect an apology when I tell you that I'm only held together by this heart that pumps glue. Look, y'all, I can't help that I'm racist. It's just the way I was raised and the way I'm raising my kids. So now here it is, Paula Dean's apology cake to show you that I have truly internalized the sentiment. 
I'm going to eat all of it right here in front of you now. Mm. Oh my God, you guys, I am just, I am so sorry. Oh God, butter chunks have been my cotton picking hand. Well, I mean, not that my hand is ever picked cotton. That's what I have slaves for. Do not apologize for being here. Take up this space, go through and out of yourself until they know that you are here and that this was not okay. And so the final presentation is a persuasive presentation. So the goal of the next student is to call for action. Uh, and in fact, our student is both the state and regional champion in this event. Uh, I think you'll see why very shortly. And so with no further ado, Anna Gay with persuasive speaking. Amy Meyer used her cell phone to take a video of sick cows being carried away from a building in a tractor as though they were nothing more than rubble. Within minutes, seven police cars arrived and officers questioned Meyer about what she was doing at the facility. And in February 2013, she became the first person to be arrested and prosecuted under a new anti-whistleblower law known as the Ag-Gag, according to The Nation on July 31st, 2013. Charges were filed against her for agricultural operation interference, a misdemeanor that carries a six month jail term despite the fact that she was on public property when she took her video. Ag-Ag laws are promoted by powerful agricultural lobbyists and prohibit taking or distributing photographs or video of an agricultural operation. Mother Jones on July 25th, 2013 reports that eight states have already passed this type of legislation. And unsurprisingly, these states are home to many of our nation's major agricultural centers. ThinkProgress.org on February 26, 2013 claims that if agricultural states continue to pass these laws, the facilities producing 99% of American meat will be completely shielded from public scrutiny. Large corporations have ensured that their despicable practices never come to light by silencing those who would show us what goes on behind the closed doors of their factory farms. The agricultural industry has been given a free pass to use deplorable and dangerous labor practices, unethical treatment of animals, and substandard safety precautions as politicians trade our food supply for corporate campaign contributions. So first, we will examine the reasons behind big agriculture's dangerous desire for secrecy. Next, explain the impacts of closing the barn doors to the public. And finally, explore several solutions to laws that Live Science on August 1st, 2013 calls the stupidest thing that agriculture ever did. The Huffington Post on August 5th, 2013 reported that George Steinmetz, a National Geographic photographer, was arrested in July 2013 after taking aerial photographs of feedlots in Kansas, absurdly claiming that his actions posed food security issues. ag, -Ag laws secured a legal foothold for two reasons the political clout of the industry, and self-regulation. Initially, the West Seattle Herald on June 24, 2013 reports that the ag, -Ag legislation was introduced because if convicted of abuse, industrial farms would have to completely overhaul their systems. Instead, ABC News on March 21, 2013 notes that agricultural lobbyists pay out enormous amounts of money to our congresspersons influencing them to pass legislation, criminalizing the whistleblowers, exposing the wrongdoings. The Sunlight Foundation on June 24, 2013, reports that big agribusinesses donated over $36 million in 2012. And the Huffington Post on July 23, 2013, claims that politicians are protecting the financial interests of their corporate agricultural backers, creating a corrupt agricultural sector protected by taxpayer dollars. Additionally, Mother Jones in August 2013 explains that agricultural producers moved to depopulated areas where they could employ less scrupulous practices due to little government oversight. 
When investigative journalism threatened their isolation, the agricultural industry revolted by endorsing AGAG. And just to be certain that the stakes are too high for anyone to threaten their self-regulation, the Dallas Morning News on April 10, 2013 reports that the industry is pushing for violators of AGAG laws to be placed on a permanent terrorist registry that would include the names, addresses, photographs, and even signatures of those convicted. CNN on April 30th, 2013 argues, you know an industry has a lot to hide when it wants to make it a crime to document what it's doing. The Dallas Observer on June 6, 2013 explains that hens are kept in cages so small they stand on top of their dead cellmates as they lay their eggs. This silencing legislation yields two dangers, governmental inefficacy and the endangerment of our food supply. First, the Kansas City Star on August 5, 2013 reports that Jim Schreier, a USDA meat inspector, investigated a Tyson Foods facility in Iowa where he witnessed workers electrically stunning animals for processing on a level so low that the animals retain consciousness throughout the procedure, a violation of the Humane Slaughter Act. But after reporting the findings, the USDA reassigned Schreier to a plant 120 miles from his home just for trying to enforce the law. The agricultural industry uses its political capital to render those responsible for reporting violations powerless. Without the protection of government oversight or conscientious whistleblowers, nothing remains to keep these practices in check. Additionally, AGAG -AG places animals in each of us at risk. Rolling Stone on December 10th, 2013 reports that from a moment a pig is born, she spends four or five years in a tiny crate and kept perpetually pregnant while fed growth promoting drugs and sometimes even garbage, including ground glass from light bulbs, used syringes, and the crushed testicles of their young. Sadly, these practices are considered normal on factory farms and places at increased risk of salmonella, E. coli, mad cow disease, and even antibiotic resistant superbugs. The Forbes website on April 16, 2013 reports that tests on grocery store meat from around the United States found that over 50% contained antibiotic resistant bacteria. The National Public Radio on April 11, 2013 claims that these laws eliminate the only source of oversight available. These undercover videos, all we have left. Christian Science Monitor article on July 5th, 2013 explains that most people would not believe that their food might come from battered animals who were insane and cannibalistic from confinement so intense they could not turn around. Fortunately, there are simple solutions to combating the legislation that allows these abuses to flourish. To begin, the agricultural industry's large donations have given them unreasonable power over our legislators. If we are to fight back, we need to be aware of how much money our representatives receive from the industry. I have created a website called endaggag.com. Visit to see if your state has an ag, -AG law, what it prohibits, to view the contributions your congresspersons receive from the industry, as well as find ways you can help. The most important among these is following the provided links to your state and federal legislators' contact information. You can simply copy and paste the text I have provided or create your own message to request that our lawmakers are doing all they can to combat AGAG. See me after the round to pick up a card with the website URL. AGAG only works if it keeps us silent and uninformed. If we spread the word, the laws lose their power and we gain ours back. Finally, let's make it more difficult for big agriculture to hide their dangerous practices. You can help by supporting, supporting the Humane Society, whose brave volunteers put themselves at risk by becoming the volunteers who, by becoming the whistleblowers who show us what goes on behind the closed barn doors. Financial donations or volunteer work help them to continue to provide the only access we have to factory farms. Also, follow Ind Agag on Facebook and Twitter 
where I post updates about any new legislation or legal battles involving AGAP and evidence gathered by whistleblowers. If you don't use social media, you can go to my homepage where I provide information from these Twitter and Facebook feeds. Email those you know, talk about it, but please don't remain silent. With law standing in the way of our right to know, it is essential that we share the knowledge that we have. It shouldn't be left up to us to protect ourselves, but it has been. Together though, we can give every shred of insight we have the importance it deserves. The aforementioned Mother Jones article states that consumers have a right to know where their food comes from. Today, we examine the real reasons why ag, -AG laws are being pushed, the damaging effects this legislation will have on Americans, and some solutions to fighting these laws. Through public pressure and action, we can stop the unethical practices placing animals and our food safety in jeopardy because no business should be allowed to keep their bottom line healthy at the expense of public health. Uh, being an excellent audience, uh, if you have any questions for any of the speakers, please feel free to ask them to get their names or any questions about their events for any extra credit assignments we'll be doing. Uh, feel free to do so. And again, thank you very much. Uh, you've been incredibly helpful and a wonderful audience. I will see you all in class soon, I'm sure. Thank you, everybody. Good night. And that is, there's so many people to thank uh, that support the speech team that make it possible to do what we do. Uh, and so there's, for a long time coming, uh, some people have deserved credit. Uh, well, it's not very large, but I wanna give basically forensic service awards uh, to people that have kind of dedicated themselves to our organization uh, and, and uh, given us wonderful opportunities to do what we do. Uh, the first one uh, goes to our MC of the night, uh, Ms. Deborah Swan, Ms. Deborah Swan. So I'd like to award uh, Deborah Swan with a Forensic Service Award for her dedication and giving us an amazing place to host this and providing refreshments to nourish and sustain you during this next hour. So please run applause for Ms. Deborah Swan. Thank you. Thank you. I get to star, and I am a star. You are Thank a shining you. star in my life. Oh, you are wonderful. Um, keep the second one. Uh, the second one uh, is someone who has been uh, my closest ally and the only reason I'm able to do anything uh, as far as travel, uh, as far as navigating the bureaucracy that is Central Texas College sometimes. Uh, she has been the single source of allowing the team to do what it does for so many years. Uh, she's been nothing but a friend uh, and an amazing colleague to help make everything happen. Um, and I, I talked her into staying late so she could be here for this. So I'd like uh, Catherine Pangelina to come down and receive her service award. Um, and the final award is a very quick one, but is, it is, it is uh, sorely needed. Again, we've, we haven't done any of these awards before, and these people have been, have been deserving these for so long, but our final award is actually the Alumni of the Year Award. And this is dedicated to the, to the member of the team that continues to give back to this activity. It requires the hours of service, and I'm the lone coach uh, here at Central Texas College. Uh, a lot of other teams have a staff of two or three coaches uh, to help work with all of the students on the teams. And I, it's just me, flying solo uh, here at CTC. Uh, and so uh, this person has been the tournament coordinator. Uh, we've hosted the state tournament for the past three years here at CTC. Uh, and the reason we're able to do that and kind of show off to the rest of the state of Texas, uh, why Central Texas uh, knows what's up, is through this, the, the actions of this individual. So Daniel Kahn, can you please come up and receive the Alumni of the Year Award. Thank you. 